we can start. So Stefano, are you introducing uh, Light Sound? With pleasure. So uh, okay, thanks. So yeah, uh, thank you, Andrea. So uh, well, I'm I'm very very happy to have uh, Light Sound Yang today at the, the Georgi Colloquium. I mean, uh, my son is professor of uh, um, dynamical systems and uh, uh, neuroscience uh, at the Courant Institute uh, in uh, New York. And she, she has been in the last uh, three years, she has had a joint appointment at the Courant Institute, the Institute for Advanced Studies in Princeton. Uh, she, she, she's uh, very well known for her contributions to uh, dynamical systems and uh, and the body theory and uh, statistical mechanics, and uh, she 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 studied uh, uh, she 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 began her career as a graduate student in uh, in Berkeley under the supervision of uh, Rufus Bowen, and then after I mean she has been after several appointments she she has been first at uh, UCLA for almost ten years, and then uh, since uh, more than twenty years she has been at uh, at the Courant Institute. And she has received many uh, prizes and uh, she, she is a member of many academies, including the National Academy of Science. And she has been an invited speaker at the ICM in 1994 and uh, a plenary speaker at the ICM again, uh, but the plenary as a plenary speaker in 2018. And uh, uh, I, her work has influenced many, many people in, in, in dynamics. Uh, she, she, she has been uh, uh, extremely, I mean, her, her, the, the techniques she has developed in the study, for example, of billiards have been applied to, to a lot of uh, uh, different systems. Mm -hmm. And uh, she, she, she's, a, as on a personal note, I, I always deeply enjoy listening to Lei Sang, who is a, who is not only a fantastic mathematician, but he's a, she's also a, a, a fantastic speaker and very inspirational. And, uh, um, and she is able to, uh, to uh, communicate the joy of doing mathematics when she speaks uh, to a level which, is, uh, which I find rare. So thanks a lot and please go ahead. Okay, well, uh, thank you very much, Stefano, for, for this very kind introduction. So uh, let me say first that uh, please feel free to stop me with questions along the way. Uh, I, I am perfectly uh, fine with that. Okay. Um, so uh, let me start with a disclaimer. Okay. Um, the, what constitutes an observable event or a typical trajectory is clearly context dependent and will, it also depends on what it is that you are interested in. So what I'm gonna present is one notion of observability or typicality. I, I do not claim, especially in infinite dimensions, that this is the only uh, notion, vi viable notion, or the only reasonable notion. It's just one notion that I would like to uh, propose. Okay. So with that, um, so let me start with a finite dimensional setting. Okay. So for the, the, the next uh, so many slides, uh, so the phase space is either Rn or finite dimensional manifold. And I'm looking at a differentiable map, which maybe for convenience, let us assume this invertible. So it's a different morphism. Little m throughout the talk will denote the bank measure. Okay. The setting is very simple. So I think about an open set U okay, that gets mapped into itself. So the closure of U gets mapped into itself. And so if I keep iterating forward, the images get smaller and smaller. If I take the intersection, I'm going to call that an attractor. Okay, that's the setting. Now in finite dimensions, it's very often the case that people equate observable events with positive Lebesgue measure sets. Okay, this is fairly standard. And with that mindset, here's a kind of a dream picture that I would like to propose to you. Okay, uh, so suppose I, I, I since I'm, I'm interested in observable events, so I start with Lebesgue measure M, I use the map to transport that forward I push that forward. Uh, so if uh, uh, hopefully it will converge to something and, and the, what, whatever it converges to will be an invariant measure. Okay. Now the, I, I, this is not a theorem, right? This is a picture that I'm painting that I will be discussing. Okay. So if I transport the big measure forward, hopefully it will converge to some invariant measure. 
And if I define the Epinoff exponents, the growth rate of the norm of uh, the derivative, okay, uh, either mu almost everywhere or Lebesgue almost everywhere. So if I do that, then it could be negative, it could be positive, of course, it could also be zero, but let's assume it doesn't happen so much. If it's negative, then we can hope that mu is supported on a sink. <laughs> And if it's positive, then uh, the, the hope is that it will be supported on a, a, an SRB measure. So let me quickly uh, review what an SRB measure is, since not, not everyone, uh, maybe not everyone knows it. Okay, so now it's be, be, with, with the emphasis on uh, measures that are equivalent to the big or the Riemann measures. Um, uh, so for Hamiltonian systems, Liouville measures are obviously the measures of interest. Okay? So let's, let's consider, it, and what, what I say will apply to Hamiltonian systems as well, but let's suppose it's not a Hamiltonian system. Suppose it's dissipative in the sense of volume de decreasing. I don't have a physical context, so by dissipative, I really mean loosely the idea that something that is not uh, uh, volume conserving. Okay? So when that is the case, then there is no invariant density. Okay. Now, in particular, I want to look at dissipative systems where there is some kind of sustained expansion, i.e. there's a positive Lyapunov exponent. So here's the definition, formal definition of an SRB measure. That is an invariant Borel probability measure is called SRB if there is some sustained expansion, positive exponents almost everywhere. And the conditional measures of new on unstable manifolds have densities. Okay. Now, this last sentence, what it says is that if you look at unstable manifolds, there are some lower co-dimension, there are some lower dimensional manifolds. You see stacks of them around mostly. And geometrically, it says that the measure, even though it cannot have a density, it really is it's, it's concentrated on stacks of lower dimensional objects on which it has densities. Okay? So this is a geometric picture that I, I, one could think of when there's no invariant density. There may be densities concentrated on lower dimensional manifolds. And if I'm gonna go uh, back a couple of times to a couple of slides to look at this dream picture. So what this dream picture says is that I, I start with a big measure, I transport that forward, it converges to some invariant measure. And basically there are two scenarios that either lives on sinks, finite number of points, could be periodic sinks, or it could live on some if there is sustained expansion, then it lives on some uh, lower dimensional stacks of lower dimensional uh, manifolds. Okay, so this, uh, if this is true, this would be a very nice uh, picture to have. Okay? Now, this picture was in some ways presented by uh, well, SRB measures in particular, not the pictures. All right, uh, SRB measures were introduced by Sinai Ruon Bowen, after whom the uh, measures were named. They were first constructed for Axiomae attractors in the 1960s, and. Uh, Ledra PA and I and others uh, generalize that to more general dynamical systems, so it doesn't no longer has to be axiomatic. And let me very quickly explain why uh, it's reasonable to think that if you push forward uh, the bank measure, that it's going to tend to something as a that's SRB. Well, you take a piece of a phase space. Suppose this, but put a bank measure on this. If it's stretching, then I push it forward. It, it will go to the Lebesgue measure, something like this. And if I keep doing this many, many more times, it will stretch more and more in this direction and contract maybe in some other directions. <clears throat> and in the end, the measure will line up in these uh, uh, stretch directions, which are the unstable manifolds. And this, of course, is a very idealized picture. And we know that it's more complicated than that in general. But nevertheless, this is the motivation behind thinking that if you push forward Lebesgue measure, it should either go to the sinks if everything is contracting, or it should go to some lower dimensional manifolds. And this is the picture that I would like to work with. Okay. Oh, maybe I should say also why technically, on a more technical level, why are SRB measures important, and uh, how do they con con uh, how to connect them to the idea of observability? So if I take a point x in the phase space, I'm going to call this future generic with respect to a measure. If, uh, if you look at the uh, for, uh, trajectory average in forward time, as n goes to positive infinity, it goes to the integral of that measure. That's why future generic, right? I'm only going forward in time. And a result uh, proved by Pugh and Shub around 1990, building on the work of many others, such as uh, Piscine and Ruel, okay, says that if you, have an, uh, if you have an SRB measure, 
And there are a couple other conditions, ergodicity and no serial epinoff exponents. But basically, if we have an SRB measure, then the set of future generic points is, has positive Lebesgue measure. In other words, the, the, the invariant, the SRB measures are observable, even though they are singular measures. Okay, so we want to focus on observable events. There is no invariant density, but if you do have an SRB measure, if provided it's ergodic and no zero exponents, then you don't see the measure itself, but you see all the points that reflect the statistics of that measure. It's observable. Okay, so I'll give you a little proof of this uh, theorem, a sketch of a proof, is that, well, so the, you have locally, you have the unstable manifolds and you have the stable manifolds. Okay, uh, SRB means that if I take these, these uh, horizontal curves, the unstable manifolds, for most curves, the big almost every point on this is typical, is future generic with respect to my SRB measure. Now, what are these? These, these are stable manifolds. That means that in future time, these manifolds are gonna to shrink to in, 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 in diameter so that all of the points on each one of these stable manifolds will have the same future. So that means that if this point here is generic, then the entire curve here will be future generic. So provided that this foliation is reasonably nice, if you only have Lebesgue almost every point in this direction, you can integrate out and get a whole full two-dimensional set of uh, Lebesgue, uh, 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 positive Lebesgue measure set of points that have the same property. Now, this property, of course, is very, very important. And I'm gonna come back to talk about this some more, okay? For, for this to happen, you do need some regularity of the stable foliation, which I'm going to uh, talk about some more, okay? Uh, so uh, going back to this dream picture, the same picture that I showed, push forward the bank, either goes on a sink or, uh, So is it true? It is true for axiom A um, dynamical systems introduced by Smale in the 1960s. And this picture was proved by Ruel in the 70s, okay? So axiom A is when everything, everywhere points are expanding and contracting uh, on the sets that matter on the attractor, okay? Unfortunately, it's not true in general, okay? And that's because dynamical systems are really very messy objects. If you take a uh, take the general dynamical systems and you push forward the big measure and need not converge, what may happen is that the limit could fracture into lots of bits, okay? As in the case of Newhouse's infinitely many sinks. And this is not just a worry, it actually happens, okay? You push forward a measure, it could split into a few pieces. It could actually split into infinitely many little bits of pieces, okay? And even when it converges, the limit need not be SRB. And this is the canonical example that people show. This is called a figure eight attractor. So you have a point here and a home clinic orbit of, of, of a flow. You can look at the time one map if you like. So everything converges to this figure eight, but this figure eight, this would be the unstable manifold, but it does not support measure. So the only measure supported at P. Okay. So it's, there are all kinds of these uh, reasons that one could think of them as coincidences and one could think of them as you know, uh, dynamical systems are just messy in general. Okay? And even when it's all true, this is really, really hard to prove. Okay? Even for, uh, for, for, for examples that have SRB measures, and some of these examples are known, uh, but it's still very hard to prove, uh, except when you have, except in this case, when you have these expansion and contractions, very clear directions, very clearly segregated, it's very hard to prove that you have positively epinoff exponents on proof of the but or that you have an SRP measure. So, uh, so, so, so this is the, the end of that very first segment on finite dimensional systems and what the dream picture might be. Uh, I, I, if there are questions about this, this may be a good time to uh, pause for, No, then I will go on. Okay, so what I'm gonna uh, discuss next is that, well, if I add a little bit of, so we have a really nice picture, which unfortunately is not always true. And I want to convince you that if you just add a little bit of noise, then a lot of it becomes essentially true. So let me go to random dynamical systems, okay? By which I mean the following, uh, you take a phase space M and a, 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 a collection of self maps uh, from, from M to itself, okay? So for example, the space of CR uh, maps from M to itself, 
put a probability measure on the on this space of maps. And by a random dynamical system, I just mean the composition, I decomposition uh, of these random maps. Okay. Now I can do this in uh, in just forward time, or I could do this in backwards time. Okay. And I'm going to use the notation of Fn omega omega being a sequence of omega n's. So th this is the these are the random maps that are drawn. Okay. And I'm going to write this as though it was a single map, but it's actually the composition of a bunch of different maps. Uh, in case you worry that this is not, this is a very unnatural situation. An important example is, of course, the stochastic flow of different morphisms, which generated by SDEs. So here's an SDE. This is a standard Brownian motion. And so it's a, it's a theorem proved like 30, 40 years ago now that for almost every realization of Brownian path, there is actually a one parameter family of flow maps. Okay, so phi t of x omega. So, and everything works just like, as though it was like an ODE, except that you have an omega attached. So F in particular, it satisfies this uh, uh, flow condition that if you flow time s plus t is the same as flowing first s and then followed by t, but of course you have to shift the Brownian path also. Okay. So the uh, representation of SDE in terms of stochastic flows of different morphisms is something that uh, is, is a, offers a very nice connection um, be, from, from, from between dynamical systems and, and random dynamical systems because it allows us to, uh, to, to play with this, uh, to the, the, the spatial geometry, okay? the geometry of phase-based geometry. It allows us to play with that. And, the, uh, uh, it has actually turned out to be the case that iterating a single map and composing these maps, is, there's really not that much difference, meaning that many of the things that you can prove for the iteration of a single map, you can also prove for uh, these kind of random dynamical systems um, and more. Okay. So uh, I like to look at two notions of uh, invariant measures. The first is the usual stationary measure defined to mu is called stationary. If when you push forward uh, using one of these random maps then average over all the randomness, it doesn't change the usual notion of stationary measure. But I would like to focus more on the pathwise viewpoint, uh, which is to take some views as a, a, a stationary measure and omega is a path. And I like to take this to be a two-sided path. So I want to start not to in, start to integrate, so to, to start to iterate starting from time zero, but from time minus infinity. And I'm gonna define mu sub omega, or sometimes I would write it like this, okay, to denote the measure obtained by mu conditioned on the past. Okay. So, so for each past from minus infinity to minus one, you have one such measure and this collection of measures is called sample measures. Okay, so the, these, these ideas have been around for quite some time. I just like to connect that to this uh, picture that, that, uh, that we, we have. Okay. So, um, so, so the, these measures and these sample measures are invariant in the sense that if you uh, use the zeroth map, F, uh, omega sub zero to push it forward, then you just really get the measure associated with the shifted sequence. So they're invariants, they're kind of pathwise invariants as opposed to invariant when you integrate over everything, okay? And the next sentence is really nothing more than uh, saying that it's conditioned on the past. So one way of understanding these measures is to say, well, uh, let me go back, let me go back uh, to, to, to time minus n and I start to push forward this measure mu uh, and, uh, uh, and then let n go to infinity. I look at the push forward measure and let time go to infinity. And that is nothing more than uh, by, by is a simple martingale convergence argument that just gives the uh, these sample, gives the sample measure. So why am I talking about these things? Is that these describe what we see at time zero, given that the transformations f omega n for negative n have occurred, okay? And, and that is almost exactly the natural invariant measure that we had hoped for in the, when we push the bank measure forward in a deterministic situation, 
Okay. Well, so so it, 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 uh, what exactly how how exactly does one in, interpret this? You know, suppose that you have uh, a recorded history for something for the last two hundred years. Then you go back two hundred years and you don't know anything anymore. So you have to assume everything is on average, right? So you you use mu, but then you know that the history for you know what happened the last 200 years. So you use that information to push that forward. And that is more or less what we see, what, are the, what the sample measures are. Well, this is almost exactly what I was talking about, pushing forward the big measure, except that there's almost, it's not exactly equal to, uh, it's M, it's not, it's, we're pushing forward mu and not M. But mu is not too different than M. If there is genuine randomness in the system, like with, with some uh, ellipticity or hyperellipticity, mu is almost exactly the same as M. Okay. So I would say that uh, while we hope for the convergence of this quantity in deterministic systems, and it's not always true, in random dynamical systems, we have it almost for free. There's nothing much that you have to do to, to get it. Okay. It's not completely the same, but it's pretty close, okay? And let me mention also that in this pathwise notion, you can define the Epinoff exponents and entropy in a, in a way that's very similar to the deterministic sense. And these numbers are non-random, okay? They, they don't depend on the omega, the, the, the path, okay? Now, so in this uh, dream picture for, for deterministic systems is not only that the limit uh, exists, but that is either a sink or an SRB measure, i.e. a measure that's uh, supported on some lower dimensional manifolds. And the next theorem, uh, result has been around for a while, uh, says that this is indeed exactly the case for random dynamical systems. So let's start with a random dynamical system with stationary measure mu. Okay. And you have to have some integrability condition so that the Epinoff exponents are well-defined. So. And then the first statement, which is proved by Pachon in the 1980s, said that if the Lyapunov exponents, so Lyapunov exponents are well-defined under these conditions, okay, if this is negative, indeed, these sample measures are supported on a finite set of points, we call them random sinks. Okay. You start with mu, which could be something like Lebesgue, but as you transport it forward, what you see at time zero is that the measure is concentrated on either one point or a finite number of points. These points are, of course, path dependent, depending on the, the, the what if, which events transpire, these points may be in at different locations, but uh, so that's why we call them random sinks. They depend on the path, the path of uh, path of omega. And if mu has a density, so it's kind of like Lebesgue, uh, have mu having a density for random systems is much easier to arrange than, uh, than, than without the noise. Okay. So when mu has a density and then the Epinoff exponent is positive, then these sample measures are random SRB measures for almost every omega. Okay. Uh, random SRB measures means that you, you look at it at time zero and you see a picture which is exactly like an SRB measure. The measure is supported on some lower dimensional stacks of stacks of lower dimensional manifolds, but it's random in the sense that those stacks may move around. They kind of tilt and they move, they shift in space. Okay? So it's random, but the geometry remains the same. It's a, it looks just like an SRB measure. Okay? So this second result was uh, deduced from by, so when, when I proved this result with, with RP originally, we didn't know how to see this directly. We went about proving this entropy formula. Okay. And then from that deduced that. That's a, a somewhat, I, I, I hope this is on in the, of independent interest, but it's a, a more indirect route of uh, proving it. And then it started to bother me that I, if, 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 if I really believe that, uh, you know, random systems and deterministic systems uh, are very similar, except for the fact that random systems would knock off one of these uh, unfortunate coincidences, then I should be able to prove it directly by pushing forward uh, as a uh, the bank measure. And this is what I did with uh, Alex Blumenthal uh, uh, a few years ago, that, uh, I, we prove this result with directly by pushing forward the big measure and adding little bits of noise. And uh, so why is it that it was true? It's exactly that picture that I showed you. Take a piece of face space, push it forward. Uh, so it stretches and then 
well, there may be some bad coincidences, but a noise kind of took care of that and it converges as, as we thought that it would. Okay. So this is the, uh, um, the I, I think this is the end of the, uh, of the finite dimensional part with noise. I'm moving to infinite dimensions next. I wonder if anyone would like to discuss what I said. Okay, going to infinite dimensional systems. So I have uh, pitched a lot of this idea of, of, of observability with based on Lebesgue measure. So now when I go to infinite dimensions, Lebesgue measure is not there. And to motivate ideas, let me first talk about a special case when there's a finite dimensional center manifold. Okay, so um, the, the, this, the, it, I, I just find it easier to first talk about this instead of jumping into the relatively messy situation. So it, for, for the next few pages, okay, uh, let me think about X as a Banach space, F as a map, F C plus, I need it to be a little bit more than C1, okay. Uh, for, for, for purposes of the results that I'm going to state. And I'm going to assume that there is a reference splitting. This splitting is not, not an invariant thing. I just want to decompose the space into two directions, a center direction and a stable direction, so that I can talk about things relative to these two subspaces. They're not invariant, okay? And they, there is an absorbing uh, slab in the sense that if I take a, a, a slab along the EC direction, so infinite in the EC direction, and uh, some finite radius in the ES direction, that a piece that map, that's, that slab will get mapped into itself. So it's a kind of an absorbing set that, uh, that brings the, the, the that, that make, makes sure that uh, things are not drifting to infinity, but are contracted to something. And then I'm going to assume the invariant cones direction. So by invariant cones, I mean, uh, so a cone in the C direction is just consists of vectors that are, that are, that are, have a bigger coordinates that, that, are, that, that, that is bounded away from ES, okay? So it's, it's around the EC direction and bounded away from, from, uh, from it, it's, it has a bigger component in the EC direction than the ES direction. And it's invariant if such cones are mapped to itself. And also, I'm also assuming that in, for, for vectors in these cones, the vectors cannot be arbitrary, contracted by arbitrary large amounts. It can be expanded, is EC, is, is, is neutral, okay? So it can be expansion, it can be contraction, but it could not be infinite contraction. So it's contracted by, um, and uh, the, the, um, it cannot be contracted by more than some particular amount. And then there's an ES, uh, there's a CS, there's a contraction in the stable direction. Uh, you have to, of course, define this a little bit more carefully because you cannot iterate the map backwards, but so you just do the usual things. And in that direction, you, the contraction can be arbitrarily strong. Okay? And the contraction in, C, in ES is stronger than what is in EC. Okay? So this is the usual standard uh, invariant Cohn's condition. And this condition is satisfied by many equations, such as uh, uh, reaction diffusion, damp Klein Gordon, and so on. Okay, okay so I, under these conditions, this is a very simple picture of expansion in some kind of neutral expansion contraction, whatever in EC, and stronger contraction in ES. So this is the the only uh, these are the only conditions uh, that I, I'm assuming, I, and I'm going to state three results under these conditions, the first two of which are very standard results. Okay? Uh, they may have been stated differently. They were probably proved uh, differently for uh, specific PDEs or specific classes of PDEs, but it's all the same and it's, it's not new. Okay? I'm just framing it in a particular context that's very suitable for dynamical systems. So the first result is the existence of center manifold. Uh, so that under these conditions of EC and ES, there's a graph from uh, EC to ES of, uh, called WC. The graph of this function is called WC and it is invariant. Okay. So this is a, a very standard thing that has been proved by many people uh, many, many times before. Okay. Um, 
but they, they, it, may, it may not have been stated this way, but this, that's what it is, okay? And the second result is the existence of a stable WS foliation, okay? So by which I mean the following. So, so the, the, this object, there is a, the, the, there's only one, one piece of graph. Here for each X, passing through X, you have a graph. You have a graph that depends on X. So passing through X is a piece of graph of a function from ES to EC, okay? So, and together you have, you, they, they fill up all of the phase space. These are disjoint uh, uh, graphs and they fill up all of the phase space. And each one of these graphs get moved, get mapped into the, the, the stable manifold at X gets uh, mapped in, uh, into the stable manifold of F of X and is contracted by some number along these leaves. Okay? So this is, uh, these are the, I, I don't know who I should be attributing this result to, but it's definitely a result that's been around, though probably not stated this way. Okay. Um, the, 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 the conditions under which uh, it is true is been, it's probably the, the, uh, the, the ones that I gave, uh, but, but you know, people has assume different conditions about the, oper the, the linear operator of the PDE to prove this. Okay. So here's a picture that I have. In the EC direction, there's one piece of unstable manifold. And then in the vertical direction, in the ES direction, I have a whole foliation, the leaves of which are mapped one to another and it's being contracted. Okay, so the, the next result, which is the one that I wanted to state is the absolute continuity of the stable foliation in the case when the center manifold is finite dimensional. So what absolute continuity means is that if you take two transversals to the WS, so one of them could be the center manifold or it could be anything else. So they are transversal, so they are finite dimensional manifolds. Okay. And if you look at the map that obtained by sliding from X to theta of X along the, these, this uh, stable manifold, this is called a holonomy map, then this map preserves the Levate measure class. So uh, that, that means that it doesn't preserve the big measure, but it preserves the big measure class. Zero measures are taken to zero measures, positive to positive and so on, okay? So I'd like to uh, interpret these results for you and tell you why I think they are important, okay? So the picture is like this, right? I have a piece of center manifold and a whole foliation of stable manifolds. So the existence of a finite dimension of WC center manifold just simply says that well, even though the dynamics happen in infinite dimension, the large time dynamics really are captured by uh, what happens on a finite dimensional manifold or near a finite dimensional manifold, right? So the dynamics is captured by a finite dimensional object. That's what the existence of center manifold says. The existence of this stable foliation says more. The existence of this foliation says that you take any initial condition, say here, u0 here, there's always an initial condition v0 on the center manifold so that the solutions of the, these two, so that these two solutions would converge to one another exponentially fast. So it says that every, every initial condition, every solution is track, will track one that, that's on the, on the center manifold. And moreover, the two uh, solutions will converge exponentially fast. Okay? So that's what the existence of this stable foliation says. Okay? Now about absolute continuity of the stable foliation, which is the part that I want to stress. Okay? What it says is that the Lebesgue measure class on WZ, so this is finite dimensional, so there's a Lebesgue measure class on it, okay? is the same on any K-dimensional manifold transversal to WS K being, of course, the also uh, K being the dimension of WS, okay? So you take any K-dimensional manifold transversal to WS, uh, K cannot actually be bigger than the dimension of WC, but, it's, but if, I, if I say same, then I better take K to be the dimension of WC, okay? So if I take another transversal up here, then the Lebesgue measure class are the same. In what sense? Same with this quotation means that if I, by sliding along the stable uh, foliation, Okay, so if I, I identify them by sliding along the stable foliation, then the big measure class is the same. Now, what this does is that it introduces a notion of almost everywhere, 
for properties that depend on the futures of orbits. Okay, so futures of orbits meaning that well, uh, which points have the same future? Right, it's points on the same unstable leaf. Right, these are the points that have the same future. Right, there may be other points that have the same future, but all the points here have the same future. So. A property that depends only on the future of an orbit, not on the orbit itself, but on the future of the orbit, either holds on the whole WS or not. Okay. And for such properties, they are really fine, it's really a finite dimensional property. So, and you can talk about the, the uh, you can talk about the Lebesgue measure of the, uh, of such things. In other words, you can take a K parameter family for, for any K bigger than the dimension of WC. You can take a K dimensional family of uh, initial conditions. So you take not one initial condition, but parameterize it by some K dimensional box. Then the notion of almost everywhere makes perfect sense for as long as you are interested in properties that depend on the futures of orbits. Okay, so this is an interpretation that I kind of would like to propose. Okay, so now this is part of the idea that observability in the sense of Lebesgue in infinite dimensional spaces, Hilbert Banach spaces, and a general idea uh, can be. Uh, one can deduce this a notion of observability in infinite dimensional spaces via finite dimensional probes. Okay? This is general idea has been around for some time. It's it's a it's in the classical theory of uh, Benjamini and Linden Strauss in the in the a book that's uh, has been around for a long time. This idea was rediscovered in the notion of shyness uh, by Hunt Sauer and York. These are these have nothing to do with dynamical systems. You just want some notion of a bank measure in 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 uh, uh, infinite dimensional space. So what do you do? You send in probes. You send in finite dimensional spaces to probe it is to see if you, it hits how it hits your set. And by probing that, you can derive a notion of a positive measure. So what is done here is that what I've done is I've added the dynamical meaning to this. Okay? So these measures make a, a, the, the, it's, it's a little bit, uh, well, I, I don't know whether it's more or less than these, it's not exactly the same. Okay? I'm focusing on properties that depend on the futures of orbits. And basically what I'm saying is that if the center direction is finite dimensional, then the, this, the future orbits, namely stable manifolds, is really can, can be parameterized by finite dimensional uh, sets. And, well, but it may not be consistent. In order for this notion to make sense, you need this notion of absolute continuity of stable foliations for that to make sense, okay? So this is my connection for, for a notion of almost everywhere in infinite dimension in the dynamical setting uh, to finite dimensions. So, um, <clears throat> so let, let, let's talk about a couple of results. Uh, for infinite dimensional uh, systems. Then to fix ideas, then let me just look at this, this particular class of PDEs. Uh, so X is some function space, A is linear operator and so on. Now, um, I, I, this, this slide is about what it takes to leverage finite dimensional dynamical systems ideas. Okay. Um, of course, these equations have been studied for a long, long time. I don't know. Okay. Uh, but in order to leverage the type of finite dimensional systems, dynamical systems ideas that I talked about, one needs the following. Well, first, there has to be a phase space. Okay. Of course, uh, no phase space, no dynamical system, right? And there has to be a well defined semi flow. Yes. Okay. And you need some continuity in T. Don't care about differentiability in T at all. That's, so that's fine. Okay, this is the condition that one has to be a little bit more careful about uh, to arrange. Okay, in order to treat this infinite dimensional system, to iterate this map, the time T map, uh, as though it was in finite dimension and to leverage all the uh, properties that the, the, the kind of uh, finite dimensional theory that I have uh, been, been appealing to, one would need some differentiability probably for CR for R equals one plus alpha, a little bit more than one, okay? And this is gonna impose some restriction on the choice of function space. So see, it's not just, the, it's not just the, uh, the space that you start from, but you have to keep the same space okay, when you look at it uh, time one later, okay? 
and the differentiability has to be with respect to the same norm in both domain and range. Okay, so this is not something that uh, people always do in in PDE. Okay, and so now I, I should emphasize that the naming a phase space uh, with this property okay is not something that you need if you want to study one solution, right? Okay, you just study that solution. Why, why do you need the whole phase space? Okay. Um, it's not something that you need if you want to construct some special solutions. But if you want to uh, treat it like you would iterate a map as in finite dimension, but this is what you need. Okay. So uh, the next slide uh, is just, just, just says that uh, this set is not empty. <laughs> that, that's, it's actually very far from empty. So here's an example to say that if you have a monarch space, and you have a sectorial operator, which means that uh, a linear operator that generates an analytic semigroup. Okay, then if you think of the this is A is Laplacian, and this is L two, and this is H two, or something like that, then there is uh, it's a theorem that says that there's always a family of interpolation space with uh, with norms that are stronger and stronger if you go that way, and weaker and weaker if you go that way. Then how does one apply to how, how does one arrange for this uh, C two property? Is that given an equation like this <clears throat> from A, you have this picture, and then you go to the nonlinear term, and you look for an alpha so that capital F from x alpha to x is C R. Let's say C two. Okay, for such an alpha, uh, theorem says that the semiflow is C R from this space to itself. So it's, 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 it's not a problem arranging for this, but you do have to kind of choose it a little bit. And by solution, I, I, I mean a mild solution. Okay, so uh, I would like to discuss two uh, general results for this infinite dimensional dynamical systems, meaning that it's not for a specific PDE, but uh, treating this, uh, uh, this kind of evolutionary PDE situations uh, as a, uh, as an infinite dimensional system. And so the technical assumptions are more or less what I, what I said. You start with a Banach space or a Hilbert space. You take a, you take a flow, which is uh, from here is continuous semi-flow, but aside from zero, I need it to be, I need this to be C2. So the time T maps needs to be C2. Um, and I'm actually not 100% sure that I need this, but I used it. And so let me state this. Uh, that FT and DFT are injective, which uh, amounts to some kind of backward uniqueness. Okay. Now this, I need this. Okay. I, I need to know that there's an attractor. So there's a compact set. Usually people start with an absorbing set and then eventually have things uh, converge onto a, a compact set. Okay. So this is the setting under which my infinite dimensional uh, uh, systems results will apply. And the, okay, so once you have this, it follows that there are lots and lots of invariant measures on this attractor A. The problem is that there are probably too many. That's, I mean, that's because you take any compact set, take any continuous map of a compact set to itself, there's always tons of invariant measures. So the existence of invariant measures is not a problem, but there may be lots of them, and it's not clear which one is more important. Okay. So now I'm gonna go through the same program that I've discussed on finite dimensional systems. There's, so there's the idea of the of exponents, which describes infinitesimal behavior. Okay. And from that, from that infinitesimal behavior, I will go to the associated nonlinear objects, which are stable and unstable manifolds. And then from that, I will go to the absolute continuity of stable foliation. And from that, I will make my connection between uh, 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 the bank measure in, and the notion of almost everywhere in infinite dimensions. So let me skip the second part and just say something about the first and the third. Okay, okay so this is a, a time T map of a semi-flow and mu is an invariant measure, any invariant measure. So for the epitope exponents, um, the, 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 this, is, this is very far from uh, new, right? This is all kind of review stuff. I hope you don't mind. Uh, okay. So for a single operator, if I just take a single linear operator from a Banach space to itself, there is a notion of Kuratowski measure of non-compactness or equivalently essential spectral radius. Let me think about it in terms more in terms of the Kuratowski measure of non-compactness because that is a notion that's kind of more 
uh, that, that works better when you when you compose different maps. Okay? So the, this is defined as follows. If you take the unit ball, B1 is a unit ball, okay, map it forward. Uh, if the operator is compact, of course that's compact, then you can cover it by you know arbitrarily small sets. But in general, you can always cover it if for as long as T is bounded, you can always cover it by some uh, balls on finite radius. Well, you keep shrinking that radius and see if you can still cover it by a finite number of such balls. And the smallest number is the Kuratov, is the Kuratovsky measure of non-compactness. Okay. Now, this is useful because in the ergodic theory setting, you can compose these things quite easily. You can look at the Kuratovsky measure of compactness for the, the nth uh, derivative, the iterated n times. And there is a kind of some additivity uh, uh, condition that tells me that this log thing, the, the log of the Kuratovsky, the, there's, a, there's a function that is well-defined. The, there's an asymptotic growth rate in the, uh, in, in, in the, in the uh, Kuratovsky measure of uh, non-compactness. So now this is a theorem that was proved many, many times by many people, all in slightly different conditions. But basically, I'm gonna just state the ergodic uh, version. So what it, what it says is that in an infinite setting, infinite dimensional setting as, a, uh, as a, above, if you take something which is, is a little bit above the, uh, this, this uh, essential spectral radius or the, the, the Kuratovsky measure of compactness, just cut it off a little bit above that, then what you can do is that you have a finite number of the Epinoff exponents and the decomposition of each tangent space into a finite number of subspaces together with a big one. Okay, I mean, so in this finite number of, uh, uh, of, of, of subspaces, you have, is the picture is just like, in, they're, they're finite dimensional and you have Lyapunov exponents exactly as in finite dimension. And I've just lumped all the contracting stuff into one, okay, that, uh, it, into one subspace, okay? And in this subspace, I know that it grows slower than that number, okay? So it, it, this is really just a direct generalization of a single operator. You pick out, you, you suppose it's quasi-compact, you pick out all the finite number of uh, uh, dimensions, and then you put all the, the rest of it uh, into one chunk. And there is a theorem that says that for the Epinoff exponents in infinite uh, dimensional dynamical systems that work exactly the same way. It's just that it's now moving along orbits and it's not a single operator anymore. Now, uh, so in order to proceed with uh, copying the finite dimensional theory in some ways, one needs to be able to distinguish between the expanding neutral and contracting directions. Okay? So in order to have these space separated. So one assumption that's needed is that this non-compactness index, it has to be inside the ES. Otherwise you would be lumping these things together and you cannot separate them. So you need this number to be, to, to be in, in the ES part, okay? So I'm gonna assume that. If I assume that, then it's known that you can prove the existence of local stable and unstable manifolds. The proof are very similar to those in finite dimensions. You have to be careful, can iterate backwards since no compactness and so on. But but, but they just go through, it's not, it's not local statement, still manifolds are, are, not, are not an issue to prove. And after you have done that, you can also define SRB measure, meaning that, well, uh, it, uh, the epinoff exponents are defined, so I have unstable manifolds, and I just need my measure to be, uh, to, to, to be smooth in the unstable setting. So I can define those, all of those properties. And the theorem that we proved a few years ago says that, well, consider a situation like this. So suppose when I have a C2 a semi flow, okay, and under these conditions here, where I can distinguish between the expanding and contracting directions, and suppose I have an SRB measure which has no zero Lyapunov of exponents, then the stable foliation is absolutely continuous. Okay, so in other words, the result, the third result that I showed you uh, in the setting of uh, 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 in, in this uh, uh, central manifold, uh, central manifold setting that I showed you continues to work in this somewhat messier setting. And the implication of this result is that the notion of almost everywhere for K parameter families of initial conditions continues to make sense in the neighborhood of the attract in some set near the attractor, right? 
Now, what is the difference? Okay, the, in, in, the, in that earlier simpler setting, the whole space was made up of one center manifold and a foliated by uh, 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 stable manifolds uh, in a geometrically very clear way. Now I have assumed no such thing. The measure only has positive and negative Lyapunov exponents, but locally the picture continues to look more or less the same. Okay. Uh, it's messier now, okay? Uh, it's, not, it's not really continuous, so there could be bits that you have to drop, but locally you continue to have a picture that has a fair amount of the, uh, shows a fair amount of resemblance to that uh, simple big picture. And for exactly the same reason, the stable foliation is absolute continuous. So if you locally take a stack of initial conditions, uh, uh, you can talk about the notion of almost everywhere. Uh, for as long as the properties that you're interested in depend only on the future of the orbit. Okay, so um, let me uh, uh, summarize what, what, what I have here. So in finite dimension, I have one often equates, I'm not the only one doing that, this is done a fair amount, that one often equates observability with positive Levesque measure events. That seems to be fairly uh, reasonable in the sense that the bank measure does occupy a notion of special importance in finite dimensions. Okay. Now, building on this idea, there's a very nice dynamical picture. This is that dream picture that I presented to you. Okay. That unfortunately is not always true. And even when it's true, it's very hard to prove. Okay. So for finite, for deterministic systems. Okay. So, but then I, told you that with the addition of a little bit of random noise, doesn't have to be much, it's just, just enough random noise, then this very nice dynamical picture becomes almost automatically true with some small caveats, okay? So this is a picture in finite dimension. If you focus on Lebesgue measure, it's a really nice picture that you would like to have, don't have it, quite have it, maybe it's actually true, but it's, 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 it's kind of impossible to prove but add some noise and then you have it. So now I go to infinite dimensions. Okay? In infinite dimension, like this is so based on the bay that I need to be able to connect to it if I want something similar to happen. So there's a notion of almost, every, almost everywhere that, that connects with the bay via in finite dimensional probes. Okay? That's because for, for most dissipative systems to set the collection of stable manifolds really is finite dimensional. Okay. So there is a connection to finite dimension via these, uh, th these finite dimensional probes. And so these results together suggest the following program. Okay. In infinite dimensional dissipative dynamical systems, meaning uh, I, now I mean having an attractor. If you look at these four points together, uh, what it says is that, okay, so if I want to connect to the bank measure, I now have a way to do this, okay? I have a notion of almost everywhere that connects me to finite dimensional space, okay? but to, to connect me to the bank measure, but connects me to finite dimensional systems in particular. But so what if I can connect to finite dimension, I still don't, can't do much of anything um, if I don't have any noise, okay? But so why not add a little bit of noise, probably forcing it in a finite number of modes, then it should follow from this discussion uh, if the content of it uh, is, is correct enough to be uh, in, in, a, in, general, in a general enough setting, then adding a, a forcing, a randomly forcing a finite number of modes in an infinite dimensional system should produce the same nice dynamical picture uh, that we have in finite dimension. And uh, this is pretty much what I would like to say. Thank you. Okay, Franco. Yes. Hi, thank you Hi. for the Hi. extremely Hi, nice question. Very nice. Um, I have several questions, but let me ask the first one, a technical. Uh, do you use uh, two-point motion in analyzing the random dynamical system in finite dimensions, or is not a tool, a fundamental tool? It depends on what you want to prove. Uh, since I only uh, got to the point when I have posit talked about Lyapunov exponents, uh, two-point motions are not necessary. But if you start to talk about mixing properties, 
then that would come in. So for example, if you want to prove that in the random sync situation, there's only one point and not a whole collection of uh, sinks, uh, then something, actually something more than the two point motion is, uh, would be involved in, in, in such considerations. I, I stopped with the Epinoff exponents and for that it's not, it's not used. So it's for mixing, but not for uh, right. RSB measures. Yes, thank you. Uh, no, no, the SIMI SRB measures need not be mixing, right? That could be could be permuted around. And, and another question, uh, in finite dimension, you showed a, a stochastic differential equation with uh, Stratonovich noise. Yes. Um, the case uh, when you have uh, RSB measures and good properties is uh, when this noise uh, is uh, a little bit, let me say, uh, special from the ellipticity viewpoint, uh, or an additive noise works as well. It it can be it can be uh, it, it actually uh, that that was really more an example. Uh, what you really need for this SRB property is, however you get it, you want this stationary measure to have a density. I actually don't even care about the random maps coming from an SDE. It could be any kind of uh, random maps, okay? but I need the stationary measure to have a density. And that's where, where it comes from. And so in, in infinite dimensions, uh, you expect that uh, just an additive noise on few modes uh, could work for uh, this problem. That, I'm hoping that it would, because after all, we only care about a finite number of directions, right? So maybe enough, in, uh, more in principle, maybe forcing it in uh, more directions than the number of uh, unstable, uh, than, than the number of positive exponents uh, should typically give it to you, but of course, I don't know how to prove that. I've seen recently the results uh, of uh, uh, Bedrosian, uh, Blumenthal and others on the positive uh, Lyapunov exponent for the Navier-Stokes equation with no- Oh, well, but that's very different. That's for, first of all, that's a Lagrangian situation. It's not uh, for the infinite dimensional system, right? So it's really like a time dependent, uh, 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 it, it's, the, it's Lagrangian chaos and also, the uh, Lyapunov exponents, uh, it actually comes a lot from the noise. Right. Right. Ah. Right. Right. Ah, okay. You so you don't... From the noise, it is not a consequence of the dynamic, you say. It's... No, no. I mean, in finite dimension, there is a theorem that says that if you take a uh, finite dimensional dynamical system, I think this is a result of Baxendale, that if you take a finite dimensional dynamical system and add noise to it, there may be some small technical condition, but very mild, then either you have positive, so the only way for all the Lyapunov, or conservative, I forgot to say, this is important. So if a conservative setting, add some noise. So either all the, uh, either there's one Lyapunov exponent that's not zero, that means that has to be positive one, right? Or there's a rigidity result that says that uh, the system actually is, um, is, is not that, but it's something close to being an isometry. It has to preserve some extremely strong structure. Thank you very much. Perhaps mm -hmm. it's good that, that I did the, the other. Thank you again. Okay, any more questions? I think that in the chat, there was a, a um, yeah, there was one person asking for the slides. Yes, so maybe, exactly. uh, we'll uh, contact you about uh, about sure. them. Yeah. I'd be happy to share. Um, I have a rather general and maybe naive uh, question. So, concerning uh, reaction diffusion systems, um, is there a general way to characterize uh, the center manifold? Uh, just because uh, it's you mean uh, local or the inertial uh, manifold? Uh, say locally, for example. Yes. 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 The, the, so if you go back, the trouble with this theorem is that I need to have an SRB measure, right? The center manifolds are there and the picture locally has the stable and unstable, but I may not have an SRB measure. And which means that I don't know that the measure is smooth on my center manifold, okay? And this is the part that, uh, and I have the same problem in finite dimension. It has nothing to do with the infinite dimensionality. Mm -hmm. That's the part where the noise comes in. It gives you that smoothness. I see, okay. Thanks. Yeah. 
Thank you. Okay, so apparently there are no more uh, questions. Uh, so we would like to thank you again uh, so much for your uh, very nice talk. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thanks a lot. Okay. Thank you. And Th thank you for having me. I guess, yeah, we'll probably contact you about uh, 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 the slides. Uh, uh, so there was sure. a request and uh, OK, we'll, <laughs> we'll see what uh, we can do. OK, thanks. OK, thank you. Thank you very much again. Okay.